OK. So let's now turn to this question of the standard model as an effective field theory. So we have sum over n. We're treating this from the bottom up. So we're going to just talk about what the degrees of freedom are and then think about constructing operators. And part of the job has already been done for us because I'm assuming you have a background in the standard model, at the least at the level of knowing what the Lagrangian is. And if you haven't, then you should look at the quantum field theory 3 lecture notes. And so the L0 here is the standard model as taught in quantum field theory 3. So what we'll mostly be interested in is the higher order terms. But let me nevertheless remind you of what the degrees of freedom were in the standard model. So you at least know what the players are when we go to talk about L1. So it's a gauge theory. So we have color cross SU2 weak. the U1 of hypercharge. And so we have eight gluons here, three weak bosons here. And one guy here. So just to, to introduce some notation for fields, I'll call these guys with a index capital A running from 1 to 8, these guys with an index lower A running from 1 to 3, and B here would be the analog of a photon field for U1 of electromagnetism, but this is the U1 of hypercharge, so it's B, B mu. So we have gauge bosons, we have fermions. Let me do the fermions over here. So an important thing in thinking about this as an effective field theory is to note what the mass scales are. So maybe I should do that already here. Photons are massless. That's one combination of the weak and U1 boson. Gluons are massless. That's these guys. And then there's the mass of the W, 80.42 GeV. Mass of the Z, 91.19. And for the first time in me teaching this course, we also know what the mass of the Higgs is. So let me just, that's not part of the gauge theory, but I'll just list it there as well since it doesn't fit in with the fermions. So fermions. So you can see that these scales here are kind of similar. For the fermions, there's a broad spectrum of scales, and that's why I wanted to put them all on one board. So quarks, up quarks, down quarks, strange quarks, they all come in left and right-handed guys, and the gauge couplings are different for left and right-handed for the electroweak and U1 parts of the gauge group. So there's six different flavors, and both right and left-handed. What masses do we have? Up quarks and down quarks are rather light, but a couple of MeV. It's hard to measure the light ones. It's a little easier to measure. Everything's going to be an MeV. I'm going to stop writing MeV. Oh, that's not true. I switched to GeV. <laughs> Sorry. Everything's going to be in GeV. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's the top quark.
Okay, so there's a pretty wide range of scales here from an MeV to 100 GeV. That's just the quarks. And then we also have the leptons. Three types of charged leptons. Again, with a fairly wide range of scales. So now I'm switching back to MeV just to keep you on your toes. <laughs> Oops. Then we have neutrinos. The left handed ones we've studied much more than anything else. And in particular, what we know most about the left-handed guys is mass splittings from neutrino oscillations. And these are pretty small numbers. We also know that overall these things are quite light from cosmological constraints and otherwise. And we don't really know about anything like a sterile neutrino that we could put bounds on its mass. So even within the standard model, there's a lot of different scales. And if you think about it from an effective field theory point of view and you think about it from the top down, the first thing you'd get rid of would be the top quark. And then you'd get rid of the W and the Z and the Higgs. And then you'd proceed down. The next thing to go would be the bottom quark, et cetera. And you could think about constructing an effective field theory by integrating out one at a time, getting a new effective field theory every time you remove a degree of freedom. Uh, you could take the standard model and expand in that fashion. That's not the sense in which we, we are thinking about it. That would be the top-down sense of taking the standard model and deriving something else. We're thinking of it here in a different context where we have all this stuff. And we're actually interested in thinking about physics at higher energy scales, beyond the scale of the weak bosons, beyond the scale of the top quark the things we're trying to figure out from the, at the LHC, scales we're trying to probe. That's the attitude in this bottom-up approach. OK, so the lowest order Lagrangian would be the gauge sector, the fermionic Lagrangian, the Higgs Lagrangian, and we have right-handed neutrinos, we need a Lagrangian for them, too. So, you know, these are the topic, these are topics that come up in, in QFT3. I'm not even going to touch them at the moment. I can't give you a complete review. But just a taste emphasizing things that are important. So to give you a taste, I just write the other two down, which are the prettier parts anyway. So we have field strengths for the kinetic terms for our gauge bosons. And the fermionic Lagrangian, I can write it as a sum over the left-handed fields, fermion, covariant derivative fermion, and a sum over right-handed fields, fermion, covariant derivative fermion, where this covariant derivative is a covariant derivative with these gauge fields, so there's some gauge coupling G1 for hypercharge, some gauge coupling G2 for SU2 weak, and some gauge coupling G for QCD. So what is the power counting? So we've just said what the degrees of freedom are, and what kind of some of the guiding principles are, the symmetries, the gauge symmetry. You learn much more about symmetries in quantum field theory 3, so I'm not going to go into that, but those are basically the guiding principles in figuring out this L0. 
what is it that we would do a power counting in here? So the power counting in this bottom-up approach is related to what we left out. So we're expanding an epsilon here, where epsilon is mass scales in the standard model divided by things that we've left out of our description. So in the numerator would be things like the top torque mass, the W mass, Z mass, Higgs mass, all the mass scales of the standard model. In the denominator, well, certainly something like M Planck is left out of our description here. If we had some grand unified theory, that goes in the denominator. If we had supersymmetry and we broke it, that would go in the denominator. So from this effective field theory point of view, any physics that we've left out of the standard model description is anything that generates a higher energy scale, that goes in the denominator. And this is what we expanded. So even not knowing something about what this physics is, we can come up with a universal description, a universal L1, that describes corrections beyond the standard model. And what we'll be describing that physics is higher dimension operators, operators beyond dimension four. But they'll be built out of standard model fields. So kind of from your teaching of quantum field theory, it may be perhaps, perhaps the idea that these two things are connected may be clear to you, but it's something that we will actually cover mostly next class, actually. We'll, some, some part of the beginning of next class will make this connection between the fact that we want to expand in that epsilon and the fact that we can do, in doing so, we get higher dimension operators will make that absolutely clear. That'll come next time. So in the remainder of today, let me just address one final point. And that is the idea of what it means to have a renormalizable field theory. So in our description of the standard model that I gave here, I mentioned symmetries, I mentioned degrees of free freedom, I didn't re mention renormalizability. So what does renormalizable mean? So the traditional definition of what renormalizable mean would be the following. You would say a theory is renormalizable if at any order in perturbation theory, in this quantum field theory, the UV divergences can be absorbed. So there's UV divergences from loop integrals. If they can always be absorbed into a finite number of parameters, then you'd say the theory is renormalizable. But that's a traditional definition, and we will use a more general definition here. Certainly, this was a guiding principle when people constructed the standard model. What is the effective field theory definition of this? It's a little more general. because it brings in the idea of doing power counting. So the effective field theory's definition allows for the possibility of having an infinite number of parameters, but at any order that you truncate the theory, there should only be a finite number. So it says that a theory must be renormalizable order by order in its expansion parameter. If there's more than one, it's expansion parameters.
So even just this sentence alone tells you why power counting is such an important part of the effective theory, because the effective theory to make sense as a renormalizable quantum field theory needs to know about its expansion parameter. We're saying that it's a renormalizable, that we can make sense of the theory, absorb all the infinities, only order by order in expansion parameters in general. So it could be that you do some calculation, you encounter some divergences, but if they're higher order in the expansion than what you need, and you have a power counting that tells you that, they would be absorbable into some operators that you haven't even written down, you can just drop them. So this definition allows for an infinite number parameters that are needed, for example, for normalizability, but only a finite number at some fixed order. Now, if you take this logic that I just said to you, that you could think about things more generally, then you can ask, well, what was the point of thinking about the Statter model where the theory turned out to be renormalizable in the traditional sense? How does this fact, which you know is just a subset of this case, but an important one, how does it fit into this rubric from an effective field theory point of view? And so the way that that fits in is as follows. It could turn out that your L0 in your expansion is renormalizable in the traditional sense rather than this more general sense. And if that's true, what it means is that you don't see the higher energy scales from your lowest order Lagrangian. So we do not know directly about lambda nu from just looking at L0. And that's what happens in the standard model. We don't really know precisely what the high energy scale should be just from studying the effect, from studying the leading or Lagrangian. This will not always be the case. Sometimes we'll be in a situation where when we study the effective theory at lowest order in the Lagrangian, we really find that it, even in order to make sense of that as a quantum field theory, that we need to that there's an, a scale that gets generated and it's part of our expansion and there's some terms that we calculate with L0 that end up being higher order in our expansion and, and we can't renormalize the theory unless we actually uh, include higher dimension operators. Chiral perturbation theory is an example of that type and that's an example that we'll treat. So it's not always the case. In the standard model where it's renormalizable in a traditional sense, that's a special case, though it's an important one. So questions? OK, so hopefully this has been partly a review of some things that you've thought of, of before, but putting them together perhaps in a nicer package. And we'll continue next time talking about the standard model as an effective field theory, what can be gained from that, how do we construct the operators, and we'll keep going from there.